Welcome, everyone. This is Steve Adubato. This is the Leadership Hour. Every week we check in with you and talk about issues that matter when it comes to leaders and people in management positions and all kinds of issues that those of us who are crazy enough to want to lead face. The mistakes we make, the successes we have, the lessons we learn every day. I'm here with my colleague who has been faithfully and in every way working hard to make me look good. Uh, great leader, Mary Gamba. How are you doing, Mary? I'm doing great. Thank you for that compliment. It's true. It's early, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be talking to our good friend, Kevin Slavin, who is the president and CEO of St. Joseph's Health, who knows just an awful lot about leadership, not just in the healthcare world and leading a great hospital organization, but, I mean, leading change and uncertainty in the marketplace and the healthcare world changing every minute around him, how you keep your folks motivated and engaged and not scared to death. And if they are scared to death, how do you deal with them? So Kevin's going to be talking to us about that. By the way, Mary, let everyone know as they're listening to the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour how they can check in with us. Absolutely. So first of all, on Facebook, Steve, they can follow us at Steve Adubato PhD, and that's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, and as well as on Twitter at Steve Adubato. And also in the second half hour of the Leadership Hour, uh, our public television FIOS program, State of Affairs, in which we engage all kinds of leaders. I just actually had a great conversation with the president of the Senate, Steve Sweeney, the attorney general, Gray Walls coming in. Uh, We've got the governor, Governor Phil Murphy coming in, whole range of folks, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, all kinds of leaders in public positions. That is what State of Affairs is. That's the second half hour, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Mary, you ready to go to Kevin Slavin? I think that's a great idea. On the line right now, we have Kevin Slavin, who is the president and chief executive officer of St. Joseph's Health. Uh, how you doing, Kev? I'm doing great. Kevin, listen, uh, first of all, thanks for joining us. His schedule is as ridiculous as any hospital CEO you can imagine. Every day is different. Uh, the schedule changes by the minute, as does the hospital and healthcare industry. Fair assessment, Kevin Slavin? Yes, this is no doubt the biggest change era I've seen in my 30-plus year career. Because? All started by the Affordable Care Act several years ago, and not a lot of the attention was paid and, and is not paid today on some of the key elements of that that are still in place, which is the changing of the payment system in healthcare and the changing of the delivery system. All the attention is focused on the insurance aspects, which are controversial and, and whatnot. That's so interesting. So let me ask you this. Uh, Steve Adubato here with Mary Gamble. We're talking to Kevin Slavin from uh, St. Joseph's Health. I'm curious about something. And we've had uh, some of your colleagues, and Kevin is a top executive with the uh, Hospital Association as well, so he deals with his colleagues all the time, other hospital CEOs and presidents. How do you deal, truthfully, with the fear and the uncertainty on the part of the many, many employees at St. Joseph's Health around the uncertainty in the healthcare world? Well, first, it takes constant communication, but also talking about it and having them understand that it is an uncertain environment and that, first off, it's okay to feel nervous and sometimes upset. And, do you? Uh, that's a natural. Ke- Kevin, do, times, do, do you feel you do? Do you show them that? No, you don't. <laughs> as best you can, you don't. You know, and you and you say that we will continue. And I have the pleasure of running an organization that just finished its 151st anniversary. So my mantra is: this is a very resilient organization. It has seen twists and turns and challenges far greater than we've seen today and in the future, and will continue to, you know, move forward, weathering the current storm and. Uh, I usually close by saying, as I do my employee meetings, that in 151 years, there'll be a different group of people in a room like this talking about St. Joseph's. You know, Kevin is also, by the way, background, Kevin, let folks know the other places you've been a leader in the uh, hospital world. Sure. I spent about 15 years in Morris County at the St. Clair's Health System. Uh, Came to St. Joseph's about 12 years ago as the chief operating officer and ran the day-to-day operations, and then had the opportunity to uh, be a CEO 
on my own for the first time at East Orange General Hospital in Essex County for 10 years. And uh, upon the retirement of my predecessor here at St. Joseph's, I was selected by the Sisters of Charity and the Board to lead the organization about four years ago. You know, I'm going to follow up on something Kevin said about having been the chief operating officer as opposed to being the chief executive officer. But real quick, I want to disclose something. Mary and I are big fans of uh, full disclosure and transparency. For the last several years, not only have I coached and and done executive coaching, leadership development, crisis communication. I shouldn't even call it crisis. I do media coaching at St. Joseph's Health for physician leaders and others. And Kevin and I have worked very hard along with Tom Casey on the communications marketing team and helping people to be the best communicators they can be. So I just want to disclose that. Kevin, because you have been a COO and you are a CEO, biggest difference? COOs run the day-to-day operations, not just Monday to Friday, seven to seven, but around the clock and have to be, you know, present and make sure there's a competent, high-functioning team, like I said, 24-7 when they're not there. And anticipate if there's big, huge events that the CEO or the board or the organization are participating in, that they make sure that everything runs smoothly and any other problems, crises that might come up are taken care of. As a CEO, my role is much more outside the organization. I spend not as much time, maybe 10, 20 percent in operations, more of a a supportive role, checking in, making sure they have the resources and and there's no barriers, and really spend my time on strategic planning, looking into the future as best I can, uh, representing the organization in the community and at a statewide national level. We are a safety net hospital, so we're reliant on a lot of state and federal subsidies. So my job is to advocate for those subsidies, not just for the organization, but for those that we serve. As a sister charity of St. Elizabeth Hospitals, that's core to our mission, and we represent those that don't have a voice. I also spend a fair amount of time on fundraising, trying to bring new funds into the organization. Yeah, join the club, right, Kevin? We're all in the same club. Yes. (laughs) So real quick, though, I'm curious about something. Having been a chief operating officer and knowing how important the day-to-day is, are you tempted sometimes to jump in, micromanage, and get in there and get, as Mary and I like to say, in the weeds? Micromanaging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the time. (laughs) <laughs> and the balancing act. Steve doesn't I know anything about that. <laughs> often say to my team, you know, feel free to say to me, look me in the eye and say, get out. Do get they? Out of the room, stop talking. You know, we got this handled. Do they, Kevin? They do. They do. I have a great team, and I feel that's important that you have to have strong communication between each other and trust and be able to say that. I would say one of the most enlightening experiences for me was to leave an organization as chief operating officer and come back as the CEO. Really? Oftentimes when you're promoted up through the ranks, um, one of my mentors told me many years ago, if you come all the way up through the ranks and see, you know, there's many people that are only going to remember you for the different positions you had. That's their basis. So when you come back to an organization, you come back with a fair amount of more respect and, you know, in terms of your knowledge and things like that. One more quick follow-up, Kevin. You and I talk about communication all the time. You hold town meetings with your people. You put some very challenging, real, sometimes uncomfortable issues out there. And talk about transparent. That's what you do every day. Where have you developed and how have you developed? Because you know I'm fascinated as a student of communication and its connection to leadership. How and where have you developed your quote-unquote communication style? I think it's part of your nature, but working in several different organizations with a lot of great leaders who were mentors. And I had the the benefit of having CEOs that I worked for early in my career that really took on the mentorship and the development of young people and people under them very seriously and helped get us ready to be CEOs. So you learn from all these different experiences and you have to tailor it to your particular organization. You might have a basic way that you like to communicate. Mine is very straightforward, cut to the chase. If I can't answer a question, I won't. If I can, I will. But you have to understand in your organization what's the best method. Is it you know, often people think, let's send out a global email and everybody's going to understand the issue <laughs> and the strategy. You say? Um, in a hospital, and particularly in an in inner city hospital, where we have a diverse workforce, so understanding 
written communications might be a challenge for some, some of our employees, and it's better to do it face-to-face. So we do a number of things. You know, we will supplement, you know, with strong writing, and you have to have strong writers, and writers that can write at a certain level. As I said, if they write everything at the highest level that you would communicate with the board of trustees, that's not going to be effective with the employees or particularly the physicians. If the physicians need something very short, simple, it's got to be on one page or one slide or forget it, you're not going to get their attention. So it's got to be tailored to each particular audience. Legislators need everything on one page. (laughs) What what are you trying to say, Mr. Slavin, that you have to simplify it? They're inundated, like myself. I'm inundated. I must get hundreds of emails a day and things across my desk, you know, you have to, this, in today's day and age, the information that comes at you is like drinking out of a fire hose. So yeah. anything that's synthesized and simple and, you know, summarized, you can get to it very quick. Yeah, Mary and I are big fans of being concise and to the point. We'll get emails from people and we'll look at each other and say, do you have any idea what he's saying or asking for? Because this is a long email, but he never got to the point. Kevin Slavin always gets to the point. By the way, real quick, before I let Kevin Slavin, who is the CEO of St. Joseph's Health, go, St. Joseph's Health is a relatively new name. There was a branding effort that, in fact, and I've disclosed again, I was very much a part of as an outside consultant. Real quick, as a leader leading the effort to change the brand of an organization, the name, because it used to have a slightly different name. Yes? It did. Kevin we were Slavin? called St. Joseph's Healthcare System, which is really what we are. We're a system of care, hospitals home care, outpatient facilities, long-term care. But what we found is that did not resonate with the community, the patients, the families, the consumers. They don't like the word system in healthcare. It feels cold and different. And we took a look at our mission and said, you know, what we really provide is health, health to the community, health to the individual. So simplified it to St. Joseph's Health, rebranded some of our facilities, St. Joseph's University Medical Center for its academic mission. St. Joseph's Wayne Medical Center, which really is a new facility that we're trying to have that community understand, and a few other changes. Yeah, and by the way, also disclose, Mary, do you remember I was at St. Joseph's? I was doing a seminar a couple years ago with uh, Senator Booker and Senator Menendez. It was on the uh, opioid epidemic that St. Joseph's Health has led the way on. And I remember, I, long story short, I had a pain in my stomach and Kevin was like, you better deal with that. And then I wound up in the emergency yes. room it's at St. Joseph's. It's being in the right place at the right time. And then I was in, right. yeah, and I was in, in intensive care, and they took care of me for five days. So I also should disclose that the care is really good at St. Joseph's. Yeah, it's our pleasure. <laughs> Listen, Kevin Slavin, you spent more time with us than we had planned, and because what you were saying was so significant. Cannot thank you enough, Kevin Slavin, the CEO, the president of St. Joseph's Health, a friend and a colleague and a great leader. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate your time, buddy. Thank you. All right. Good good stuff. You too. Mary, I love how, by the way, Steve Adubato here, Mary Gamba, my colleague here, Brian Bordeaux here in the studio with us. I always see you taking notes when we have a great guest on, which is every guest we have. Anything you take away from Kevin Slavin? Yes. The biggest takeaway from Kevin is not only did he reinvent himself as a leader because he said it was challenging, of course, going back to an organization when you've come up the ranks and people may see you as a VP or a manager in some way, and now you're the CEO. Chief operating officer is a big title, but that's not CEO. Exactly, exactly. And not only did he have that going on, but then also, too, the rebranding of the organization as a whole. So he had to rebrand himself, reinvent himself internally with his key stakeholders, as well as externally with the community, with legislators. So that's really a double-pronged approach that could be very challenging for a lot of leaders, but he finessed it very well and offered a lot of great tools for our listeners. You know what's so interesting about this, and Brian knows this as well as someone who deals in media and communication, I remember being involved in a whole range of internal meetings at St. Joseph's as an outside consultant, a lot of what we do at our company stand and deliver. By the way, Mary, uh, if people want to check out our website at Stand mm-hmm. and Deliver, yeah, it is? Yeah, absolutely. It's stand-deliver.com. And then if they're listening and they'd also like to subscribe to our podcast, that's awesome as well. Um, it's available on Apple iTunes as well as on Google Play. But what I was uh, thinking about was not when I was working at St. Joseph's on the rebranding, they had all these focus groups and they were asking people, what do you like? What don't you like in a name? What does this name mean to you? What doesn't it mean to you? And Kevin is right. Kevin Slavin is right. The word system. It is a system. It's not one hospital. And we have relationships with, obviously, a lot of other 
healthcare systems. Why is it, do you think, that people don't like the word system, even though that is a description of what you are? So I'm thinking as a branding issue, as a communication issue, you can't simply just say, well, just tell people what you are. You have to actually ask, what do you hear? What does it make you feel? Real quick thought on that, Brian? Well, I think in healthcare in particular, you know, it's a very complex thing. As you mentioned, you were there and got great care. And I can also mention recently my family received excellent care at St. Joe's. But any of us knows that being in that arena, it is a system. But that is a descriptor. And what they provide and what they work towards is health. I think that's where the dividing line is. And Mary, it's interesting, system. Mm -hmm. Is it distant? It feels clinical. It feels corporate when you hear What's system. What's wrong with that? It is a- well, it is a business. Any hospital system, obviously, they are a business. However, the business is service that they are providing, quality care to the patients and their families. And if the families that have a choice, especially in our region, we have a choice. We yes. have so many. We are so blessed for that. I was just talking before I just got back from Rochester, and there's one hospital, I think, in the entire 25-mile region, but we have a lot of choices. So I think the most important thing to remember as a CEO trying to drive that system forward is exactly as Kevin said, it is about your customer building relationships, asking them questions, but more importantly, listening to what they say and taking that feedback of, hey, we just want it to be health, not a system. System feels cold and clinical. You know, stay on this for a minute. Even though this is the leadership hour, Steve Adubato here with Mary Gamba and our colleague Brian Brodeur, it, it's funny. This is the leadership hour, but so much, so much of what we talk about revolves around quote unquote communication. And I have to tell you, I don't separate the two. What I mean by that is when I'm leading a seminar, I'll say a great leader is, and then I'll say dot, 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 fill in the blank. And so much of what my seminar participants and my coaching clients come back with is things that involve communication. So I'll give you an example Mm -hmm. revolving around this discussion right now. A great leader is dot, 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 audience-centered. What does that mean, audience-centered? And when I try to explain that to people, I'll say a great leader steps back and doesn't simply say, this is what I want to say, this is what I'm thinking, this is how I see the situation. They step back and ask, How do you see it, Mary? How do you see it, Brian? Now, that doesn't mean we have no opinions as leaders. We're not confident of how we see things. But you step back and realize that your reality, as Dr. Richard Carlson Mm -hmm. uh, once said, the late Dr. Richard Carlson and Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, your reality is separate from someone else's reality. And if you don't understand that other reality, like we're a system, we're a healthcare system, just call yourself that. It's what it is. Well, how do other people see it? And I'll, I'll give you an example. I don't know if I've told you this, Mary, but I was doing a seminar the other day, and I was, even before you were working with me, I know that's hard to imagine. (laughs) So I was coaching someone who is a comedian. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say who he is. And I swear, I was doing this, I wasn't charging the fees that we charge right now, but I was, it wasn't a lot of money, but I remember getting this gig with this comedian, and he said, can you help coach me with my stage presence? So I said, okay. So I went to go see him perform, and I'm pretty sure it was at Caroline's in New York, and he does his material. He does his material. He is, he worked on it forever, loved his material, attached to his material. I'm watching the audience. Nothing. Nothing. They're giving him nothing. They're not laughing. And we go backstage, and he says to me, Steve, how do you think I did? And I said, "Uh, Joe, I don't know. How do you think you did? And he said, I was great. The audience stunk. He actually said something worse about the audience. So I said, what do you mean the audience Mm -hmm. stunk? He said, sucked. So I said, what do you mean? He goes, oh, my God, they didn't get it. They were flat. I don't know where these people are from. There's no way they're from New York because they would have gotten my humor. And as I listened to him, here's the point. He was convinced he was great, but the audience wasn't responding. Could you imagine any one of us saying, like, we just finished a physician leadership seminar series with a major healthcare system. We had to get evaluations from 30 physician leaders about what was good, what wasn't good, what did they like about the seminar, what they didn't like. Could you imagine if the healthcare system asked me, Steve, how do you think you did? Well, I got an A. I'm the best. Just ask me. 
Mm -hmm. You need to not only then get that feedback, but in real time react to it. What do you mean react to it? Well, if he's on that stage and the audience is looking at their phones, I mean, at that time, maybe cell phones didn't exist. It sounds like that was a long time ago. They were just talking to each other. (laughs) They were just talking to each other and not laughing. And some walking out. Yeah. Exactly. So it's almost like you do need to improvise. You can have your script if you're a leader giving a presentation at a major health conference. It's not happening. They're not responding. You need to improvise. You need to throw away that script and find something to connect with that audience. Because if not, then people are going to share negative feedback quicker than they're going to share positive feedback. So they're going to go say to somebody, hey, I just saw that guy Steve Adubato perform and it was awful. So you need to react in the moment and regroup. Think about this for a second. If you're convinced, and and really this is a leadership question. Someone might say, well, why is Steve talking about public speaking or a, a comedian? It's because to me, a great quality of a leader is to be able to step back and be, I've been on this kick recently about how defensive we are, how incredibly, incredibly defensive we are, almost as if it's in our DNA, almost as if God or some greater power said, well, if someone hurt your kid, you would protect your kid. Mm-hmm. If someone criticizes you, you will defend yourself. Of course. And you have to defend yourself. And I'm thinking to myself, the greatest leaders, the ones that I admire most, are the ones who fight the urge to be defensive, even if they think that what they're being told or what the feedback is, is wrong. The great leaders say, tell me more. I want to understand. How hard is that? I think it's impossible. I mean, we talk about it all the time, and you and I talk about the 24-hour rule. Oftentimes, the first time you hear negative feedback, oh, Steve, you didn't do well in that presentation, your first reaction is, no, I did great. You must not have been paying attention. Or There's something you, wrong with you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I know I'm good. You can't tell me I'm not good. And if you give it some time and you really look inside yourself and go back to that moment, You could take the information. The worst thing is to say, I know that your perception, right? Because you and I have talked about that before. So you perceived I was bad, but then your perception is wrong. You can't tell someone that their perception is wrong. So you need to open up yourself to that feedback, take the part of it that really resonates and tweak it and then grow from it and don't get defensive. Oh, my God. How evolved. You're listening to Mary Gamba. Her psychology hour continues, <laughs> and this is Steve I knew Adubato. that psychology degree was going to do me good one day. Uh, yeah, but um, this is real. This is real because I'm going to tell you something. As a seminar leader, as an executive coach, as someone in broadcasting, I remember I got a terrible review on one of my books, mm-hmm. and I started to argue that the reviewer was wrong. Mm, how did that go? <laughs> <laughs> How'd that make you look? It's like, well, wait a minute. That's what the reviewer thought of my book. Of course. And that's okay. He's wrong. Well, why don't we just take it off the website then? But the reality is he can't be wrong. Right, Brian? Because that's how he or she perceived it. Am I going to say, as Mary said, no, you didn't perceive it that way. Well, that we all have our own perception. Now it gets into the psychology <laughs> hour. We all have but our own is. perception. But it is. A lot of leadership is being, as Dr. Daniel Goleman said, and I know I repeat this all the time, being, quote, unquote, emotionally intelligent enough to go, "Ah, Brian, what you just said, it it can't be right. I'm going to fight you on this. Wait a minute. Hold on. Let me look at what Brian's saying. Maybe he did see it the way. That's emotional intelligence. I see it. You know, there's the self-awareness piece where you can have the ability to step back. And that overlaps. I'll throw this one out there in leadership. There's also the self-esteem piece that there is also a charisma to leaders, and those things overlap a little bit. So here, run with that. Okay, you ready? You ready? Now, this is perfect timing. People wonder, like, why we bring up things that don't seem to be directly about leadership. It's all We are taping on the day after Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a golfer. I'm a 12, 13 handicap, struggling. I've been at that level for 10 years now. But any one of us who have tried to play the game of golf, who have been humbled by the game of golf, or you don't even like sports at all. In my opinion, you had to be happy for, proud of Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. He had not won a tournament in five years. He had alcohol problems. He had marital problems. Mm -hmm. He was arrested. Mm -hmm. He's surgery. surgery, Three surgeries on his back in just a few years, a million surgeries. And I'm thinking, I had said, think about feedback. 
I was saying, and I used to be a huge Tiger Woods fan, he's done, he'll never win, he's finished, why does he keep playing? And he heard that from everyone. Mm -hmm. But self-esteem, play Brian's point, mm -hmm. play up Brian's point. What did Tiger Woods have to believe about himself and what does it have to do with leadership? Exactly. He believed in himself. He tuned out all of those voices. But hold on, it's feedback. I'm confident he took some of that feedback and applied it in a good way, right? In terms of people saying to him, you need to, uh, you know, watch your temper. You need to. He used to, you know, by the way, cursed a lot, threw exactly. his club. Not mm -hmm. that I recognize any of that, but go ahead. Exactly. And, you know, there is something to be said for, and I don't want to use the word narcissist, but there is. There's that type A narcissistic personality. Is it narcissistic or strong ego? I think they're almost one in the same. They really are. I don't think that narcissist has to have a negative connotation per se. A narcissist believes in him or herself so much that they're not going to let anyone or anything get in their way. He was what, like a thousandth in the world? Oh, and he, now was, he's like, he wasn't even close. Now he's 13th in the world yes. because of that. So literally the fact that he was able to tune out all the negativity, I believe truly that he did take nuggets of that feedback. There's a difference between positive feedback and then just noise. I think he tuned out the noise. Use the positive you mean social media noise, crazy noise, and right. and said, "You want to know what? I'm going to prove by my actions the person that I am, and that I can rise above. And if he can do it after all that he overcame, any of us can do it." What is the place? It's so interesting. What is the place for persistence? Where is the place as a leader for perseverance? Where is the place for? I'm not quitting. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving in. I don't care what the odds are. I don't care what anyone says ultimately in terms of what my odds are. I'm still in the game. I mean, that's how many times have we, Mary and I have been 18 years or so together. I mean, we've lost funders. We've lost clients. I mean, it's nothing like what we're talking about with others. But relatively speaking, I mean, you've got to have a very strong sense of we're going to come back. Yeah. But you need to believe in yourself and your organization as a leader, because if you don't believe that it's possible, then you might as well close up shop. You need to believe so that other people can believe. If the people that you're trying to get on board to buy into what you're doing, you need to show them, we are going to be here. We are going to be good. We're going to be great. What about if you're, okay, by the way, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba, with Brian in the studio here. This is only a few minutes, about five minutes left in the Steve Autobottle Leadership Hour. Real quick, Mary, people can follow on Twitter. I See, I have to do the self-promotion. I don't have to. I choose to. I, I will, I'll now do can, the self-promotion for you. do it, please. Don't great. make me so, beg. Yes, absolutely. So on Facebook, Steve Autobato, Ph.D., and that's spelled A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Twitter, Steve Autobato. And you could also check out, we have a lot of great columns on our website free. for free, stand-deliver.com. And then if they're interested in finding out about your most recent book, Lessons in Leadership, that's also on the website as well. They can find out where they can pick that up. What about the whole uh, podcast yeah, thing? Yeah, uh, we have a brand new podcast. You can subscribe to it on Apple iTunes as well as on Google Play. Yeah. Four minutes left. Been thinking about this. <sighs> Confidence. Perseverance, as we're talking about. And feedback. Pandora's box, I know. I mentioned one great athlete, Tiger Woods. <clears throat> Managing one's emotions. We talked about Tiger Woods. He would throw clubs and curse mm -hmm. and was caught on the air doing it. And you see him now. He handles himself differently. And, we, and he hits bad shots and we make mistakes. And you have to manage oneself. One of the chapters in Lessons in Leadership, you can't lead others until... You learn to lead yourself. Let's talk about the Serena Williams well, situation. I was going to say, you got to be going to tennis right about now. Well, listen, I think she's the greatest tennis player of all time. I think Tiger was the greatest golfer of all time. It's not about sports. I am so torn because I do think men and women are judged by a different standard mm -hmm. in tennis. I'm not going to turn this into a social issue with three minutes left because John McEnroe back in the day and Jimmy Connor and some others throw rackets, scream and yell, curse, whatever, say horrible things to umpires. There is a part of me that feels that Serena Williams, even though I do think she was treated unfairly on some level, needed to conduct herself as a public figure, as a leader in the world of tennis in a more dignified fashion. Am I being too tough on her? I think so. I think in the heat of the moment when what was happening was happening and she got the fault, or I'm not a huge tennis fan, there but I know a, she got— a, There was a penalty point, a then point another penalty away. point, and then a game. Exactly, and, 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 and a game. And the championship she of the U.S. She wouldn't have won Open. anyway, though. 
she, you know, I mean, it wouldn't have been a win. But after everything started to settle down, that's when she should have brought her emotions down a little bit. And that's when it's still ratcheted up. She has a great point that they are treated, that men have said more horrific things than she had said and with less of a consequence. But it was how she said it. Of course, in that moment, you're going to overreact. Well, you always say, hold on, Mary. You always say to me, Mm -hmm. listen, it isn't the point you're making very often. It's how you make the point as a manager and leader. That's the problem, Steve. And you call me on it. Yeah. And I think that when- No, I think that halfway through after, you know, in that moment when she was frustrated and she was, but then it carried on too long. Right, her immediate visceral but reaction. But how do you get yourself? How do you call it uh, internal timeout and go? I got to get myself under control. Mm-hmm. I need to stop right now. How does one do that? But you can also get a pass if this is not her mo. It's not her normal thing to do. She has been a leader, so I think that leaders, athletes, whoever is out there in the public eye, also deserve a pass at times as well. I give you a pass every once in a while. I'm sorry, why, I have no understanding why you would bring that in at this point. When I have conducted myself like a gentleman with dignity, I've managed my emotions. I have no idea. I have not thrown a racket in the office. That is true. Or in the studio where we tape at public television. You ever see me throw? No. Brian, have you ever seen? Because you don't seen... play tennis. I've never seen a thrown racket. I don't think you want Nor a racket. Nor a golf club, I would, I would say. I have heard I, about thrown golf clubs. I have not witnessed that. You have seen a bit of a temper tantrum, have you not? You mean shooting on location or in the studio? <laughs> <laughs> Define temper tantrum. Okay, we'll leave that alone. Okay. Um, listen, folks, this has been another fascinating, compelling, candid leadership hour with Steve Adubato and Mary Gamba. I want to thank Brian Brodeur and the great team. By the way, talk about branding real quick. Tell everyone the, the new name. Oh, sure. East Main Media here in Little Falls, New Jersey. That's, in fact, where we were taping. We're being listened to, uh, listened to at AM 970 every Sunday at 2 p.m. and also the podcast, Mary, real quick. Yep, on Apple iTunes and Google Play. Folks, thank you so much for listening to us. Steve Adubato here for Mary and Brian and the team. Uh, Make sure you stay tuned for the second half hour of the Leadership Hour on AM 970 with State of Affairs with that very charismatic, handsome, Mm middle-aged, aging by the minute, Emmy Award-winning anchor, Steve Adubato. Check you out next week. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by PSCNG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Suez, water solutions to meet tomorrow's environmental challenges. St. Joseph's Health, a passion for healing. It's what's inside us. The Nicholson Foundation, supporting right from the start NJ. Summit Medical Group. And by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. More importantly, we're coming to you from the Agnes Farris NJ TV studio in beautiful Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. Pleased to uh, welcome someone who people know in Newark very well. Roger Leon is the superintendent of Newark Schools. Good to see you. Great seeing you. July 1st, 2018. Your life changed dramatically. How so? Well, that was the first day that I became a superintendent of Newark Schools and extremely uh, excited, honored, and humbled uh, for that opportunity. Talk about your background leading into this incredibly challenging role. Well, I was um, born in Newark, attended Newark schools, uh, graduated from Hawkins Street School and Science High School, um, received my um, bachelor's uh, from Rutgers University, New, New Brunswick, Cook College, I continued on to my master's in administration from Montclair State University. So student, teacher, 
principal for 10 years, mm. uh, principal at uh, Dr. Horton School in the North Ward, University High School in the South Ward, um, taught at my elementary school, coached at my high school mm. in debate, and uh, for the last 10 years served as assistant superintendent of schools in various capacities, uh, overseeing the high schools, overseeing a group of elementary schools, uh, responsible for the supervision of program and instruction throughout the district, and now with this responsibility of uh, assuming it all. Roger, how many students in the public in the school system? So, 36,000 students in the school system, 55,000 plus students in Newark. Is that the charter school piece? So, part of it. So, 19,000 is the students that are 19, in, that are in the charter schools. And then the plus that I um, have clearly shared that are, I, I'm assuming full responsibility for are students that are in our parochial schools as well as right. students who reside in Newark but do not attend a, a school in They're Newark. all yours. All of them. Number one challenge facing the children connected to Newark in our schools, all schools, is? Well, we have a, a couple of problems. The primary one is obviously student achievement. Um, we are falling uh, behind uh, while there has been much progress, uh, our counterparts throughout the entire state, we have over 600 school districts in New Jersey, we're not faring as high as I know um, the capacity of our students and the quality of our staff uh, would suggest. Because? Well, there are a number of uh, factors. The, the things that we cannot control are what occurs prior to the student arriving in school and as they exit. But we're, we have them for a good six to eight hours during mm -hmm. the course of the day that would suggest to me with the type of staff that we have, with the necessary resources that they will be provided and the type of students that want uh, the very best for their own education, that with factors between the home and the school, uh, kind of focusing everyone, providing clarity, for the work ahead, uh, I'm sure that we're going to be really successful. Keeping kids safe, how challenging? Absolutely. Um, like physically safe? Well, you know, we need to make sure that everyone in our city is safe. So the passage from school uh, to home is extremely important, as well as the passage from school, uh, home to school uh, as well. You know, ultimately during the course of the day, we need to make sure that students and staff are also safe. So. You know, the worries that students have, uh, the world today is far different from when it was when I was growing up. Uh, there are a number of challenges that, that our students have. Mental health is one of the biggest factors that I think uh, is... Mental in, health mental issues health for crisis. a 12-year-old? Mental health issues for our 12-year-olds in our schools, a real serious like what, problem. Superintendent? Well, I mean, uh, I had a, a convocation at the start of the year for eighth graders in the entire city of Newark, the class of 2023, giving them challenges as well as what I did with all of the upperclassmen in our high schools. And I asked a simple question, how many of you have been impacted because of the loss of one of your family relatives to violence? And one third of 2,500 students raised their hand. Lost someone. So, you know, how are we addressing that issue? So the students come to our schools yeah. and we're, we're required to meet the literacy and mathematics uh, requirements that are outlined by the state. And we are clearly, you know, working hard to making sure that we are doing that. But the students need to come in whole to our schools. Mm. So part of the responsibility, we have teachers who not only have to teach the content, but have to teach care and, um, you know, be the custodian of the student as well as social worker. So we're really demanding on our staff, and sure. we we were built for this. So the the challenges that our students have are ones that you know we uh, will focus on and, and take seriously. I've just been 22. It was 22 years that the state of New Jersey was literally in control of the North Public Schools. That's correct. Recently, local control, you, others in Newark, in control of your own destiny. Biggest change biggest opportunity that allows for those in Newark to, quote, control, if you will, the future of the school system? Well, the last 22 years have been critical towards where we are today. So part of one of my incredible challenges is to just provide clarity uh, for everyone. And that is, in fact, our focus, Newark Public Schools clarity by 2020. What do you mean clarity? So uh, because a lot has occurred, there's a responsibility that has not been totally understood by the citizens you mean, of like the who's city in of charge? Newark. Like, who's in charge? So right now we are clear that the citizens of Newark are actually the in charge. The State Department of Education, whether we will have, in fact, the State Commissioner of Education, Rep. but 
they are no longer, they were responsible because 20 plus years ago, the state came in and said, because of the 1947 constitution requiring every student gets a thorough and efficient education. We don't think Newark's doing it. Series of cases, they come in and take over. They're not in charge, they're not involved, if ultimately responsible because of the constitution, but you guys are in charge. Exactly, so as of February 1, the state uh, Department of Education um, gave full local control right. to the Newark Public Schools. They're not hanging over your shoulder. Not at all, but there is a transition period that is about two years in the making until January 2020 that is part of my responsibility to make clear to everyone that not only are we uh, focusing on what the transition plan suggests our requirements, but that we have a far bigger plan. And, and that bigger plan is what's going to occur in the next decade. So from 2020 to 2030, part of what my responsibility in the next couple of months is to outline clear milestones of what uh, our people of need, are. need, need to do. Left. Go ahead. Well, we have this whole idea of the type of professional development that we have. I forecast that by 2025 in Newark, we will have a professional development school that will provide an opportunity for our school district to study itself, to actually assess what we've done, uh, um, applaud the accomplishments, figure out what the challenges are, strategize, and involve as many people at the table as possible, from funders to community-based organizations, from our schools to all schools, making sure that everyone is aware of what needs to be clear for everyone moving forward, what are the responsibilities of the school system, and then ultimately, how do we better our city by educating our children far better than we've ever had before. Well stated. Thank you, Superintendent. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Stay right there. This is State of Affairs, and we will be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. State of Affairs is pleased to welcome for the first time Anjali Kemlani, who is managing editor of an organization of an entity of a platform called ROINJ, which is? A statewide business news site. And by the way, check it out, folks. We're doing a lot of uh, interactive work with them. Uh, I can't tell you how much great information we get from the site. Um, question. You've been doing a lot of work talking about, writing about the innovation economy. What is it in New Jersey and why does it matter so much? Well, I think we have to ask the governor more about that, but the innovation economy... When you're writing about it, what's the hook that interests you? Well, I think it's interesting to see how we're looking at the purpose of business differently and the uh, organization of business differently, whether it's uh, looking at the way that they sit together in terms of in one building and, you know, rather than these big office parks, there's a push to the sort of urban mixed use uh, structure. And then there's also the idea of a lot smaller space. So while there are still big companies out there and ones that, you know, the ones that want to grow to that level, there's a lot of more focus on smaller level space leasing, shared spaces and stuff like that. The other thing that's interesting is I, I read your work. Uh, by the way, check out the website. You see the RR website. Check out Angelie's work and her colleagues as well. This whole thing of tech clusters, North Central and South Church, are there tech clusters in all... Th by the way, I don't even know. There's this, Stephen Colbert did a thing on whether there's a Central Jersey or not. I haven't figured it out. <laughs> or not. I know we're a big state and we're a long state. Yep. These tech clusters are... So they're sort of forming organically. From what we can tell, there are certain hubs, if you will, just they're, they're coming together, the ones that have similar interests. So for example, there's a strong FinTech presence in Northern Jersey, whether you look at Newark, where they're kind of inching to. FinTech, financial technology. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you can't do that to us, that's your work. Okay, financial. Technology. Got it, go ahead. Um, so there's- I'm gonna use FinTech on someone else, yeah, but go ahead. You'll, you'll sound cool. Uh, yeah. so oh, thanks. <laughs> it's gonna take more than that, but go ahead. So uh, there's a FinTech hub uh, sort of forming in Northern Jersey. Um, then you have the sort of Holmdel area um, that people are looking at, but there's also simultaneously a longstanding pharma and bio and life science industry in the central Jersey area where, you, you know, you look more of the uh, Bridgewater, Somerset, that area, or New Brunswick where J&J &J is. Sure. So, there, you know, that, that cluster has existed for a very long time. Um, I think it used to be a little bit more spread out throughout the state, but we're starting to see a, a really strong presence there. And then when you go to South Jersey, there is that hope of that aviation tech park uh, coming to light. Yeah, so explain that to folks. By the way, uh, if you're listening on the radio side, this is Angelique Kemlani, uh, 
a managing editor of ROI. And Jay, w explain to folks, getting a little inside here, what, what is it and why does it matter so much to the economy there? So the aviation tech park is something that has been on in the works for more than a decade. We've had congressman after congressman trying to lobby uh, for uh, funding to go into Does it. Does that include Frank Lobiondo and it others does. down there? Uh, actually, Congressman Lobiondo was one of the key people, right. um, as well as at, at the state level, uh, we had Senator Whalen, um, who you know really the pushed The late Jim Whalen, Absolutely. who represented the Atlantic City area. Go ahead. So he, so the idea was to initially um, focus on what's called next-gen technology. So it's like a different uh, technology used for uh, uh, the routing of, of airlines um, and air uh, transportation and air traffic. So that used to be the focus. That was initially the call to attention to that area around the Atlantic City Airport that has been undeveloped for a very long time. There is the FAA uh, site there, and there's land around mm. it. And so what they've been doing is been trying to develop it. Whether uh, they started initially with the infrastructure and the routing, so you've seen roads to just empty grass for a very long time, mm. and now they're finally developing it into what looks like a really robust area with a lot of um, uh, air air and space like technology companies coming in there with some interest. Angela, I'm curious about something. What makes looking at the economy in this state and the dramatic, fast-paced, changing economy in this state so fascinating to you? It's interesting to me how the companies play in the regions when it comes to working with the local government, the municipal government. That's one of the most interesting things to me is because New Jersey is very unique that way in that there's a lot of power at the municipal level to really uh, coordinate or make zoning issues, zoning planning issues, issues, planning issues, even ta just tax like abatements, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. The, the relationship is so strong. And I don't know that you can find that in many other places the same way. You think that's somewhat unique to New Jersey? I do. I really do. I think that there's different power structures where the county or state play more of an important role in some other states. Yeah. And, I, and I think that in New Jersey, we still have a lot of power at the local level. You know, I was checking out ROI online the other day, and I realized that you've done a fair amount of work writing about Camden. I, I have recently, yes. Tell us why it matters. Well, why Camden matters and your writing about it matters. Uh, Camden is an interesting story uh, because there's been a lot of political uh, power behind pushing it to where it is and to getting the attention on it, to reviving it, to you know, creating this Camden re renaissance. Um, and I think that behind all that, you don't hear the story of how, to, how it's getting there. Why does that matter? Well, because every success story has its struggles, right? You have, to, you have to fail in order to succeed. Do you want to understand and help people understand why things happen, why they didn't happen, and what it really means? So what happened, and so I, I wrote a recent uh, article on this, actually, about uh, the businesses down there and the struggle that they're having in finding local employees. And it, it created this whole discussion about whether or not local means the entire swath of Tell us, the population. Tell us what you really meant. What, what, not I, but what the, the uh, CEO of Holtec really yes. meant was that there are certain parts of the population where it's very hard to find people and to get them to come to work and, and follow a regular work schedule. And the, the, the tell that he wasn't wrong is that the entire business community has been silent. At the local level, the small business community has been pretty vocal, but when you talk about the business leaders, they've all been very quiet about the whole issue and have had private conversations saying he wasn't wrong. He said it the wrong way but he wasn't wrong. Okay, but t so we can take something meaningful away from this. What is the moral, the lesson of that? To make sure that you know what kind of an area you're moving into first. Uh, work with the local community so that you don't have this sort of uh, resistance and this struggle uh, to figure out who your workforce is. And but respectfully, sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Actually, isn't also about the need to train, retrain, and get folks ready to take on the jobs and the economy in the community that they live in? And it depends on who you talk to. Talk to the business community and they ask, why should that be our burden? Why is that not the... That's your workforce! <laughs> it, but is it, though? It's 
Is it any one? Is it government's role in, uh, individually? Is it the individuals? Is it the the corporate? It's all. Is it of education's it. role? Who's, Absolutely. So whose role is it? And and how do why why weren't conversations had where everyone came to the table beforehand? That's the key. How dare you ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> Angelie <laughs> Kemlani is a managing editor of a terrific platform with great information, important information every day called ROI and J. Um, it's a print publication. Comes out, I believe, every. Two weeks. Two weeks and also online. Check yep. it out on a regular basis. Angelique, thank you so much. Don't be a thank stranger you. on State of Affairs. Appreciate it. We'll be right back right after this. I'm Steve Adubato. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined once again at State of Affairs uh, by State Senator Bob Smith, Chairman of the Senate Environment Committee, Environment Education Committee, Steve Adubato, here at State of Affairs. Uh, by the way, I say our name and our guest name a lot because we're also heard on different platforms. Sometimes you can't see us. Uh, Senator, let me ask you this. A lot of talk about plastics, what to do with plastics. You are, one of the you are the leader in that effort. What are we doing? On the 27th of September. We're taping just a little bit before that, but go ahead. Okay. We are uh, having a uh, committee meeting where we have a whole plastics legislative package, four different bills, resolutions. What does it do? Well, the big bill, and this is as a result of the Rutgers and Princeton University professors coming in and describing the real problem with plastics. Uh, we are going to ban within a year of the enactment of the legislation, styrofoam uh, food containers, cups, uh, single-use bags, straws, and potentially in the future, maybe even more. But that's a... Oh, well, back up. Sure. No more styrofoam cups. No more. No more straws. No more. No more single, the only time you either use this plastic bag, one. Out. Gone. The only exception being on straws. Some disabled people need straws. And restaurants will be able to keep a small wow. amount of straws for those How people. How hard is that going to be to do? Actually, I don't think hard at all. You, you would be amazed the level of support in the public of New Jersey, the citizens saying, enough with the plastics. You know, every year we have the, the beach cleanups by Clean oh, yeah. Ocean Action, and they report the huge quantities of plastics that are, that are on our beaches. You look at the worldwide headlines. We literally have two more continents. It's not seven continents on the planet Earth. There's nine. There's one in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, all plastics. There's one in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, all plastics. We're killing sea life. But the real uh, shocker at this summer hearing in Toms River, we had the university professors come in, Princeton and Rutgers, and they said, one of them said, this problem is as big as the global warming problem. This problem? This problem. And the reason why the plastics are... Uh, deteriorating into smaller and smaller and smaller particles. Fish life is ingesting them. And it's not just in the ocean. It's also in the fresh waters of the state of New Jersey that are found. And they are now being incorporated into our bodies. What? And when they come into our bodies... Because they, people eat fish? Yep. And when it comes into our bodies, they bring organic chemicals, some of which are carcinogenic. <sighs> I mean, this is a huge issue, and we have to start dealing with it. Other states ahead of us on this? Uh, California is uh, probably the most advanced, but there's about five or six states that have already gone into the ban mode, and it's working well, and the citizens uh, are not uh, upset about it. They're actually applauding that effort. Mm. So I think this is going to hopefully go well in New Jersey. Where is Governor Phil Murphy on this initiative? My belief is that he's uh, uh, positively inclined. And didn't he veto a bill that you sponsored that no. tried to do some of these things? No, I didn't sponsor that bill. My name was not on that bill. And the reason it wasn't was because it put a bag fee on single-use plastic bags. Uh, five cents. Go ahead. But the problem, the problem with it is in the states where they have the bag fee, you only get 20% removal. The, the, the customers get used to paying the bag fee, and they would rather pay the five cents oh, on the oh, bag on. Senator keep Smith, on using it. I'm so sorry for interrupting. Uh, Senator Bob Smith, Steve Adubato here with the State of Affairs. You sound like you just said you didn't think it would have great impact, and that's why you didn't want to be a part of it, and that's why you think Governor Phil Murphy said no. I, I think that's true, and I think what happened was that as the, as the legislation was being analyzed for his signature, <clears throat> 
he also saw the research that said that it would be ineffective. He's got to ban it. Right. And I have, I have the ban bill in the legislature. I had introduced that earlier before the other bill even passed. Mm. So we're now going, I hope we're going forward with it on the 27th. Uh, real quick, stormwater. What is the stormwater situation in our state and why should it matter to us? Well, it's, it's the last frontier on water pollution. We've gotten industrial waste under control. We have domestic sewage under control, but stormwater is still out of control. And what it means is that whenever you have a, any kind of a large impervious surface, you What does that mean, a large impervious or uh, Shopping center parking lots, office parking lots, big impervious surfaces. Rainwater comes down and it doesn't disappear. It goes into the nearest uh, river or stream, or you may have stormwater structures that are in, in need of repair. For example, around the Barnegat Bay, there's more than, more than 2,000 uh, stormwater structures that are falling apart, not working the way they should. And one of the consequences of that is the Barnegat Bay is, is much more polluted than it has to be. But the, the end result is uh, of allowing all the stormwater to go out into nature is that you erode stream banks, you wash more, mm. more and more soil away. It's really a very what bad thing. What do we need to do? And, and right. in this country, we have more than 1,500 stormwater utilities around the country, but none in New Jersey. None? None. Zero. Because? And because the Governor Christie vetoed the bill. We actually passed the bill while he was governor. Uh, the freeholders in, uh, in Ocean County said, this is a tax, and the governor vetoed it. And so... So what do we need to do now, Senator? Well, Bob's we need Senate? to... We, the stormwater utility bill is now out of the Senate. It's over on the Assembly side, where I think it's going to get a favorable review. And what it does, does not create any new bureaucracies, but it does allow the sewer utilities uh, or the utilities authorities to now get into the stormwater business. And what they're going to do is to charge a vigorous, an Atlantic City term, a small vigorous... Vig, vig on top of the regular price for storm, storm water, for large impervious surfaces, and then that money will be used every year to start solving the problems. Hmm. And uh, it's worked, like I said, 1,500 jurisdictions And Governor Murphy on this? <clears throat> I, I, I start with the governor's maybe the greenest governor I've seen in a long, maybe long time. Maybe the greenest governor? In a long, long time. Okay, I think he Make the case. Why? What makes you say that? Uh, first of all, he wants us to get back into Reggie. All right, which the, the regional, excuse me, that is gas the, the, greenhouse, that the, the Governor Christie pulled out of that. This is the get back in. This is the absolutely the get back in. Uh, and he's also uh, a big proponent in having uh, renewable energy. 2050, 100 percent reliable reliance well, on renewables. Not just that goal. The BPU just issued a press release that they're issuing an order putting out requests for proposals for 1,100 megs of new offshore wind off the coast of We just of had Jersey. Bob Gordon, commissioner, uh, yep. talking about that. Um, State Senator. Yes, sir. Bob Smith is the chair of the Senate Environment and Education, excuse me, and, 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 energy. and Energy Committee. How long have you been there? As the chairman of the committee? No, in the legislature. Uh, 32 years. Still having fun? I'm having more fun than ever. Good for you. I have fun on my job listening to people like you and learning. Hopefully people do as well. Uh, this is... Bob Smith, I'm Steve Adubato. Thanks. This is uh, State of Affairs coming to you from the NJ TV studio in New York. We'll uh, check you out next time. Great. Thank you, Bob. Thanks a lot. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJ TV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by PSCNG, NJIT, Suez, St. Joseph's Health, the Nicholson Foundation, supporting right from the start NJ, Summit Medical Group, and by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by AM970, The Answer, and by Insider NJ. Autism is one of the fastest growing developmental disorders in the U.S. Here in New Jersey, one in every 41 children is diagnosed with autism. And when a child is diagnosed with autism, every member of the family is affected. While there currently is no cure for autism, early detection and intervention can offer critical improvements for the child and tremendous benefits for the family. To learn more about autism, contact the Binder Autism Center at St. Joseph's Children's Hospital.
I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen, and I got my life back. The sharing network means to me hope, life, and everything. The sharing network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. Pay tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life.